if the Industrial Revolution, the steam-powered loom in England gave rise to Marxism in the First and Second World Wars and Vietnam and Korea and every other conflict for 100 years and the deaths of uh, hundreds of millions of people, <laughs> you know, technological change yes. causes displacement. Yes. The fall of religions, the fall of empires, the murder of millions. So what will AI do? Exactly right. I couldn't agree more. Um, I just... I just wonder, like, what does it mean to be a human being yeah. if you have no autonomy? Mm -hmm. I'm an adult man. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. It's not just a measure of my age. It's a measure of my ability to make decisions about what I want to do and what I think yeah. and how I live and how my family yeah. lives. And so without that, what is the point of living? Like, yeah. In other words, I said I don't want to be bossed around by a machine, which is a pretty shallow answer. But it's a, I, I understand. I didn't explain it because I don't fully understand it. Yeah, how I feel about it, but something in my in my dog sense, my gut level yeah. tells me I don't want to live that life. Yeah. I'd rather be dead. Yeah, does that make sense? It absolutely does. I absolutely empathize with your reaction, and so the thought experiment is to provoke that exact emotion. It's meant to say, "I hate this idea, and here's all the reasons why." Yes, and then once you get those on the table, you can then have some kind of detachment and say. Why do I think those things? Like, what is this concept of me making decisions? Like, let's just break that apart. And that's why it takes two and a half hours to get through this. You need to hear other people's perspective. I agree. People need to say, I hate it. Some people say, I love it. And be like, but hold tight. Like, here's an example that you do already that challenges your notion on this ability to make decisions. You're like, oh, damn, good point. So it, it really takes time to work through your own beliefs and understandings because oftentimes it's just packed so deep you can't get through it. And we give each thought five seconds in our modern society. Yes. We can't get deep. And so I understand your reaction. And Tucker, if you come to the dinner, I promise you'll leave with a changed understanding of existence. If this is not an easy topic, it really takes time to, to cycle through it, to be open-minded, to hear other people. But um, everyone gets there. Like every single time, everyone gets there. Um, what do you serve? Is it all broccoli? <laughs> I do serve blueprint food, yeah. So it's it's um, the two dishes I told you about. Yeah, well, I'm getting in and out before I come, but whatever. That's just me. Um, <laughs> so y I said when when you asked, like, would I be willing to follow the instructions of the algorithm? And I blurted out without thinking about it, yeah. no. Yeah. And then I admitted, in the interest of honesty, that I don't really have any reasons for saying no, other than my animal sense tells yeah. me no. That's slavery. You can't live like that. You'd rather be dead, which is how I feel. My, that was my instinct speaking, which I regard as a kind of co-equal with my rational sense, right? Yes. I don't think it's just like some dumb impulse. I yes. think it's worth paying attention yes. to. Do you feel that way? Do you have instincts? Do you follow them? Do you attach meaning to them? I do. Um, every time I engage in a thought, I observe the first four to five thoughts my brain has yes. as incorrect. Interesting. They're usually almost wrong, almost almost always wrong. And it's like there's a bias attached to this one. This one's coming out from a preconceived notion. This one has sure. you know, like some self interest. And so I I'm constantly trying to be uh, aware of what's wrecking my ability to see things clearly at all points of time. And so um, yeah, I, I learned this. I was chronically depressed for a decade. A decade. A decade. I, the decade that you were succeeding in business. Yeah. That's right. I was building a startup. I had three little babies. I was trying to leave my religion. I was in a challenging relationship. So it just all packed into a tight. Yeah. And that's when I was overeating every night to try to soothe my own. What were you eating, by the way? <laughs> my, uh, well, we always had some sweets in the house. My partner had a sweet tooth. And so it was always, you know, brownies or cookies or leftover cake or. So it was always like, you know, just one bite and then led to a second bite. Then tomorrow we'll work out really hard and work off all the calories. Did right. that work? It didn't. I failed every single night. And I the only thing that gave me liberation is one night I was just desperate. I mean, I was so miserable. Uh, I hated myself. I just, I felt so ashamed that I couldn't stop this terrible uh, behavior. I said, evening, Brian, you're fired. Uh, you make my life miserable because in the morning I would work out I would eat a really great breakfast. All day, I'd be disciplined. Great. And then nighttime would come. I would bathe the kids, get them to bed, tell them stories. 
And then that moment would come, like the brownies, <laughs> you know, just one bite of the brownies because this is all the like, pain. This is like the Mormon version. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> You're not like going to the crack house. Oh, that's funny. You have yeah. a whole stable of hookers. Yeah. You're eating the brownies. Yeah. And so I, I basically created a character of myself. And so I would say, all right, uh, when I saw Evening Brian pull up and he'd give me all these really compelling reasons, like tonight's the last night, you know, like tomorrow morning, we'll work out extra hard. And I'd say, I'm sorry, that's not going to happen. So I fired him. So 5 p.m. to 10 p.m., I remove my ability to eat. Just like, no matter what, it doesn't matter what the occasion is, you cannot eat food. And so I started playing with my different characters of Brian, like Dad Brian, Work Brian, Evening Brian. And I found it really liberating that I'm not the behavior. I'm not the actual practice. And so this is when I started doing Blueprint as well, of like, could I construct an algorithm that actually improves me? Because I, I spent all day building technology in my company, Braintree of Emmo. You would write the code and the technology and improve it. And then you'd improve it again. And again, version two, version three, version four. So all day, my technology got better. And every day I got worse and I couldn't fix my own problems. And it was such a weird juxtaposition where technology is improving radically and I'm getting worse. So it was like this difference. And I thought this is wild that as a species, we're so focused on the improvement of our technology and we are the self-destructive species in every regard. Like what is happening? Well, that's the question. <laughs> that's the unanswered, the, the question that remains unanswered. And of course, every religion answers it very neatly and sensibly, I would say, and every religion always has. And it does strike me, if you're looking back into history, that this is the only period post-war, post-World War II, where you've had a society at scale that assumes that there's nothing beyond itself. Mm. And so that raises a lot of questions. But the first is like, why did every previous generation assume there was a God, but we don't? Mm. Like, were they all insane? Or like, mm. where did that come from? Mm -hmm. You know, if someone believes in God or not, or an afterlife or not, I, that's great. Like, I don't think, I personally think everyone come together on this. Uh, it's, we already agree on don't die, all of us do. So whether we have a story about what happens in the afterlife, what it doesn't really matter. What we do agree upon right now is none of us want to die right now, not in this moment. So let's just build upon what we agree upon in this very second. No, I, I don't know that we do agree actually, because there's no meaning without a power beyond ourself. Is there? I mean, there's only this sort of like shallow, silly or sets meaning that we attach to various things like sex or living yeah. longer or feeling good or whatever, but there's no meaning beyond our physical momentary experience. Whereas a, a person who acknowledges a power beyond himself attaches ultimate moral meaning yeah. to events, right? So like you have a, like no God, no meaning, or am I missing something? It's like, what's the point? Yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. I mean, we, I guess I try to speak in the world um, that I can operate practically. And so your thought of meaning is a biochemical process in your brain. It's a thought you have, it's a biochemical state you experience, whether it's love or whether it's meaning making or whether it's belief in death, you're experiencing this thing as a human. We can engineer this with predictability. We can engineer atoms and molecules and organisms. We, we can do this in the form of creating drugs today. We do this in the way of creating you know um, various medicines. We do this in creating implants. Like we're getting increasingly good at doing this. And so much of our reality is going to become increasingly engineered. So we, oh, I know. And so we're heading down this path where our digital reality, our physical reality, all realities, now we have the source code to do this. And this is why I'm saying that if you take any preconceived notion about being human, any ideas we have about reality, their representation of what we've been doing for thousands of years, some of that may carry over but maybe not. And so I'm inviting the conversation to say, this moment is not like the previous moments. Right. Very, very different. But, but, but here's, here's the practical, um, and I just wanna restate, I respect what you're saying and I think you seem really honest and open-minded. So this is in no way a slight, but the, but the core problem, however, is that in a moment of technological change, really revolution, yes. unimaginable, everything you've said sounds right to me, you need a framework 
by which or with the, the help of which you make important practical decisions. We used to call them moral decisions. Yes. So if there's no acknowledged power beyond people or only the power that we create through these machines and their giant data centers, um, then how can we say, well, if I feel like killing you yeah, because it pleases me, right? how can we oppose that? How can we say that's wrong? We can't actually say that's wrong. We can say it's inconvenient or it's, you know, detracts from GDP or it's unhelpful, yeah. or, but we can't say it's wrong. Yeah. How could we? Yep. Right? I agree. So we've, we basically, we've settled many of these questions today. Like if you want to kill somebody and you actually do it, there's consequences. But why? Uh, it's the way we've resolved the moral and ethical question in our society. On what basis? I agreed, but we've solved it somehow. We haven't solved it. We've just like the government has said you can't kill people. Right. But by your own description, governments are going away. Clearly they are. I don't even think they really exist now. What are countries? It's meaningless, right? I agree. Of course. So um, so like some dude in a faraway city says, I can't do that. Well, says who? Yeah. So I, It doesn't I, have any meaning at all, except to the extent that you can punish me because you feel like it. And But, but there's no way to say it is wrong or right in an absolute sense. There's no way to say anything is wrong or right in an absolute sense. Yeah, okay, I agree. Uh, what you're saying is, um, what I'm hearing you say is the technological revolution or disruption opens up the space for these questions to be asked anew, even though we don't even know where it came from in the beginning. No, what I'm saying is we're gonna have a lot more questions, practical questions about how to proceed that need to be answered now. Yes. And without any authority above ourselves, on what basis are we going to answer those questions? I see. Okay. Okay. This is what I am proposing is that just like when America was founded, yes, it was this concept of, hey, the monarchy has been doing its thing for quite some time. Not great. We think we can do this really new, weird thing of democracy and vote people in. We have these two represent representative bodies and half the people thought that's insane. Half the body's like kind of cool. Let's try it. So we chose democracy as a form of governance that, that was supposedly better than the monarch. And so in that moment, we chose a new form of governance in trying to do that. Now, we've been trying to solve the thorny questions of democracy for over 200 years. In fact, we fight about it every single day. Right. But it's still this basic idea that democracy was superior to monarchy. And what I'm suggesting right now is we are walking into a new phase of existence where we have to answer these questions anew. And we don't know what the answer is, but the, the foundational observation is don't die. So don't die individually, don't kill each other, don't kill the planet, align AI with don't die. After that, we're gonna spend the next unknown period of time fighting about what it means to don't die. But as a species, if you take, if you birth artificial intelligence, what do you use it for? Is it to become better at war? Do you become better at killing? Oh, I, I, you... I couldn't agree. Look, I couldn't agree with your conclusions more. I mean, I strongly agree with them. I'm just wondering about the basis upon which you reach them. And so without God, how can we say, and why would we say that life is better than death? Hey, it's Tucker Carlson. The internet is crowded with interesting things that don't really matter. On TCN, we attempt to bring you interesting things that actually do matter, and a lot of them interviews, long form and short, videos, documentaries. You can find all of it on tuckercarlson.com and we hope you will.